Thank you so much for, for having me. I am really honored to be part of the Women's Salon series. I've come to talk to you tonight. Uh, a message that I like to share about empowerment and really remembering that we all have the power to create change in this world. And I think sometimes our society gets away from it a little bit. We associate people who, who change the world with being famous or perhaps very wealthy. And I think it's important to remember that we really truly all have this power to, to find a small niche in the world and create some change for the better and that it can have a really tremendous trickle down effect. A little bit of background, um, I, as mentioned, I grew up as an athlete and played a lot of different sports. And then after college, I started, uh, I, went, I came here for grad school to the creative writing program to get an MFA at U of A, which is a really outstanding program here. So I was very happy to be part of it. And while I was here, I started uh, getting involved in the sport of triathlon. And after grad school ended, I, I, I had progressed enough in triathlon where I thought, okay, I actually have an ability to turn professional, and I feel like I should follow that. And yet I know that I have to have a quote unquote real job as well. And so I, I put a portfolio out to ESPN, and I was fortunate that they hired me to do freelance assignments. And it was usually a little 500 words here or there on an athlete, uh, pretty standard stuff. And then one day I got a call, this was in 2006, and my, uh, my contact there said, all right, Catherine, we've got an assignment for you. The Beijing Olympics are coming up in two years, and we're really interested to know in this modern day and age, how hard or easy is it to get to the Olympics? Because back, you know, a few years back, I mean, people could just get there if they picked an obscure sport. And we want to know if that's true in this modern day and age. And I said, great, terrific. Who do you want me to write about? And they said, oh, no, no. We want you to be the guinea pig. So try to get to the Olympics in two years. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? Well, what sport? Where? How? That's up to you. Go figure it out. Ready? Go. And I was blown away because this is so exciting to me as an athlete. Uh, and then to be able to write about it. So the, the idea was to write a column for two years and that would eventually be turned into a book. So I was, I was thrilled. I was going to get paid to do exactly what I love to do, to write and to struggle my way through sports. So I, I thought about this for a long time. And there, there is actually a book on there now, so I won't go into the entire story of, of how, how that all went. I will give you some little snippets. Um, I had been racing as a triathlete, and I was really about to throw in the towel. It was such a difficult sport to maintain racing at such a high level, but without having the right support network coming in at the same time in terms of just making ends meet. And so I, I had been doing long distance triathlon and the Olympic distance of triathlon was very different. It was much faster, like a sprint oriented. It would almost be like asking a marathoner to suddenly try to go run the 100 meters. So it's all running, but two very, very different disciplines. And I knew I wasn't going to get that fast in two years. And I thought to myself, OK, well, within triathlon, which is swim, bike, and run, my strongest distance is the biking. So distance. My strongest sport is the biking. So what, what if I tried road cycling to see how far I could get in this sport? That seems to make sense. And ESPN said, well, OK, OK, that's a good idea. But why don't you try some of those crazy fringe sports that nobody plays in America? Maybe it's really easy to get to the Olympics in these sports. Like what? Well, they said, well, the luge. And I said, OK. <laughs> I said, that's a great idea, but that's not in the Summer Olympics. <laughs> so you're really just trying to stack the odds against me here, aren't you? <laughs> so um, being that that's a Winter Olympic sport, they actually had me try that anyway. And that was the scariest thing I've ever done. After 18 months, I, alas, did not make it to the Olympic Games. I tried so hard, but how wonderful too, right? We shouldn't actually be making the Olympics in 18 months. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that would actually give ESPN what they were, they were trying to prove. However, here's the crazy part. I came very, very close, ridiculously close. I got my first professional contract with a uh, team called Cola Vida, if you're familiar with the olive oil, uh, Cola Vida Women's Professional Cycling. And at that time, ESPN called back and said, hey, guess what? We've got a, we've got a, um, 
we've got a job for you as an editor position. So now things were coming together. Now I actually had a source of income outside the cycling and I had the cycling. And so this is great. Now ESPN was heading up a site called ESPNW where they wanted to bring in more women's sports. And I got to wear a really fun hat in that department and try to bring in more of the obscure sports that people knew less about. Uh, so I was, and to write about fantastic athletes that we don't see all the time. So I was really loving this. Everything is going great. And I'm racing, right? I'm racing and racing. And I start to see some interesting things that I'd noticed even during the, the Olympic quest part. You know, coming over from triathlon, the world of, uh, of that sport was, was pretty equal. The men and the women raced the same distances uh, on the same day. They didn't technically race against each other, but they had the men's and women's field doing the same thing. Same prize money, same distance, same day, same media coverage. I get over to cycling, and everything is all about the men's side of the sport. The women are suddenly, I can't figure this out, they're racing half the distance. Um, they're making salaries that you know wouldn't really feed them past a month and then they're they were always second build you know the the, the men's race is here and oh yeah we got some women racing too and I, I didn't understand this like wait a minute what decade are we in you know and this was 2012 at the time not so long ago and i i just i couldn't grasp that and i of course then there's the journalism side of me saying why why, 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 why is this like this? So um, I'm making the documentary, things are going along well with that, and, uh, and now we've formed this Le Tour Entier. This is Emma's great name for it, which means the whole tour, okay? Which is what we're trying to do, the whole tour. But okay, we actually, we really need to know, does the world want to see a film on women's cycling? Is there an audience for this? Is there a demand? Because I knew it wasn't just about women's cycling, it was about you know, women's equality, really. And there just happened to be a lot of bicycles going by. And <laughs> so I, I put a big campaign together on uh, Indiegogo, which is like Kickstarter, and we put it out into the world. And uh, I had a whole budget drawn up of what we needed as a first time filmmaking budget. And, um, and we, we covered, we got the whole budget crowdsourced from 16 different countries, and then this is my favorite demographic, because I, I got to see all the things as they came in, um, equally donated by men and women, right? So that was, I will clap for that. That was really, really exciting, because I, I thought, and that was also what I was trying to say, is hey, we're not making a film on women or for women. We're making a, a film for everybody to try to, you know, lift, lift everything up. And, um, and people were getting that. They were so excited about it. Two days before the film, we get the call that there will be, for women, a Tour de France in 2014.